All right, today's topic is Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal, and the subtitle is there on the screen as well, for preventing the children of poor people in Ireland from being a burden to their parents or country, and for making them beneficial to the public. It's called A Modest Proposal. Uh, it often just goes by that abbreviated title. Uh, but the title, the full title is significant because this is an essay. What it also is, in terms of a genre, is something we've not yet encountered either last semester or this semester, but what, which is a, one of the literary forms recognized by the ancient world, namely a satire. It's a satire. And satires are used quite frequently in the ancient world, in fact. And they're used today quite frequently, and they're used in scripture, furthermore. And it's necessary to recognize the genre uh, employed when reading anything. Um, because otherwise, you misread what you're reading. And so, for example, is satire in scripture. Well, it's regularly, regularly used in the Old Testament, uh, the, especially amongst the prophetic writers. It's a mode of, of attacking someone. And you can do it gently, teasingly, politely, as is the case here in Swift's modest proposal. And there, that's a it, it's classified as a particular type of satire. Normally, you would probably call it a Horatian satire after the Roman writer Horace, the, the great classicist. And, that's, and it's civilized in its tone. It's urbane. Uh, it's gentle. It is disarming in its civility of tone. But there's a bite to it. You know that he, is, he says one thing and he means something else. And, that's because satire generally employs another literary uh, device called irony. The reader or the, the, the speaker says one thing, he intends something else. And the audience understands that he means something else by what he says. So there's a divergence there between what is said and what is meant. And we still use it in phrases although not so much even. We have become intensely literalistic in understanding everything. We don't like double meanings. And it might be because of multiculturalism. It's hard enough to understand things uh, on the surface without reading into it or understanding a subtext. Subtexts are really hard for second language, um, or they're harder at any rate. That might be one reason. It might also be because uh, we've lost a sense of uh, there being uh, anything other than a scientific reality that we are to understand an empirically verifiable, I see it in front of my eyes, that is reality world, we've largely departed from that. When we depart from a Christian worldview, that's one of the consequences is there is a sense that there is no higher truth aside from what we see with our own eyes. Question or comment? Of course. So would you, would you say that there is a, that a satire or a text with that double meaning, it's only, it can be structured in a certain way that it's understand it, it, like somebody such as, for example, somebody that doesn't understand English quite well can understand that it's a satire based on the way that it's written? I think so. It, so it takes culture to understand that? No, I think they can understand it because I think satire exists in every language, really. Uh, I don't think there are any cultures that have ever not had a uh, employed irony or understatement um, in, in their language. It's just some languages are more given to it. Like British English is notoriously prone to understatement or irony. And it used to be the case in Canada as well, um, not as well understood south of the border. They were pr they're prone to the opposite, overstatement, exaggeration. <laughs> I'm the greatest president who ever lived, don't you know? That's overstatement. 
And, and you can take it as overstatement as well and see it as a rhetorical trope, or you can think that the man who says such things is an you know, ineradicable narcissist, which could also be the case. Uh, who knows? But overstatement hyperbole is one form of literary use of language. Understatement's another one. It goes in the other direction. In general, understatement uh, suits a Christian culture better because it suggests humility. And this title suggests humility. I'm making a modest proposal. It's, I, I'm humbly submitting to your discernment that this is a way out of a very difficult situation. But I don't want you to think that it's to be taken to be uh, too serious. It's, a, it's very modest. And we'll find that the title itself plays into the whole satirical sense of the work. Now, context for this is, is important, but, but to address your question once again, I think that every culture has a sense that there is more being said or less being said than is being said. You can understand, right? Even when you speak the way you're supposed to speak, you know, with deference to those in authority, you can exaggerate it by multiplying yes, professor, or, or really emphasizing my authority by speaking of my title and so forth. And by doing that, you can insult the very idea that is behind that. Well, the professor here says, and the professor, and you go, right? And so everybody's thinking, yeah, the, the guy who th thinks that he's really smart and we all think is an idiot, right? That's, so you can do it through numerous ways, but you can, as I say, and everyone understands something in, different is intended, but you say, what? I just called you professor. That's your title, right? I mean, what, how have I been disrespectful? Well, it's tone, it's intention. This is working the same sort of way. Now, but as I say, this is a satire, and it's a Horatian satire. It, it is civil. It fits with what we saw last time in Pope's uh, Rape of the Lock. It is society where manners are being uh, etiquette manuals are being published for the first time. It's mass society. People are coming in from the countryside and brought into cities. So urbanization begins in the late, you know, the middle of the 18th century and it just keeps on going and accelerates through the 20th century, now even more so. In, I think, at the beginning of the 20th century, 90% of the people lived in the countryside. Now it's probably going the other direction huge mega cities. And with that, how do people from all over the place get along? You know, how do they understand one another? How do they prevent offense? And there's sort of there's certain standards of etiquette that you have to obey. And in a multicultural context, how does that work then? Because it's, there's, there's going to be no subtleties there. It's going to have to be more dictatorial in a sense. And that's what you find in cities. You know, there's no room for deviation on this. That, so political correctness might be a part of mass urbanization and throwing people together. You just simply have to do certain things and not speak certain ways and, uh, so that you're not misunderstood. I, I'm just suggesting, I don't know exactly what it is. But satire assumes in its audience Oh, let me just say there's another type of satire. It's the type that Jesus uses. That's called juvenilian satire. And believe it or not, it's far more savage than the Ciceronian satire or the Horatian satire, if you will. It's far more savage. And it's direct. And it's not, it's not subtle. And he employs it when he speaks to the Pharisees. You whitewashed sepulcher, you brood of vipers, right? That, that is attacking uh, without any pretense to be being civil. Now, what I find always interesting, because for those who, of us who are Christians, who regard Jesus as not only the Lord and Savior, but as a role model for everything, in terms of speech, what do we do with that? First point, note that Jesus doesn't employ that form of satire to everyone. In fact, he rarely does so. 
but he does, re he does do so in, for that particular group of individuals. There, there's no love lost between them, and he's not pretending, he's not being loving, or maybe he is being loving, but how is he being loving towards them? In his speech, he's certainly not. He's tearing a strip off them. It's a blast or like, um, because they're false teachers. So there is a use there. Did you want to comment or a question or you're going to answer the? I was just going to ask you that. I was just going to say, do you think he did it because they're false teachers? Yes. Yes. And recognized, though, as authoritative. There's a, a claim to authority being made by the teachers that are called the Pharisees. They're the main group. They're, they're not the only religious group there, but they're the ones that seem, also they seem in some ways closest to Jesus teaching on certain things. And uh, so they get particular heat. And uh, that, that's in, probably informative and probably deserves more discussion. But, but just note that it is employed. And so when we get into discussions of how to speak in public, it's not all one size fits all. There are different genres that are employed uh, depending on situation and, uh, and uh, audience, if you will. Yes, did you? Yes, yes. However, so yes, I do think there's a place for both Horatian satire and also the Juvenalian satire, which is so savage. However, what satire requires as a precondition is that the audience understand a basic moral framework and share that basic moral framework because they have to understand that there is a subtext. And it has to be clear to them. And so they have to have a shared worldview in some ways. And I, it seems to me that scripture presupposes that as well. Romans 1 suggests that the pagans are without excuse because they know Basically, they know what the truth is, but they suppress it in unrighteousness. But they know. Like there's an, an, a knowledge there of the way things actually are. They know God's power, his uh, grandeur, etc. These are seen clearly in the way things are made. That's what Paul says in Romans. Um, so despite the differences between Christianity and the paganism of Paul's day, he still thinks that there's a common ground there. Can satire be employed when people deny basic realities about the natural world? Is it going to work? I'm not saying it's not valid, but is it effective? Can you satirize if people don't understand uh, basic realities of human nature? As was the case in Paul's time. Paul talks about same-sex relations, differences between male and female, and so forth. Do we acknowledge those things culturally? Do you, can you say those without having to go through a, a lengthy explanation? Can you assume those in your audience? I don't know. I'm, I'm not seeing satire employed in this way in our day, and this is one of the main reasons is that we have our culture has moved in a way that the pagans would not, uh, they'd be shocked. Yes. So, uh, following on to that comment, I'm, I'm just thinking about, for example, stand-up comedy. Yes. Uh, somebody from another, from different culture, comes into a stand-up comedy show, and it, it's basically a satire monologue, right? Yep. It's basically, during that, would that come into play, like, uh, just how it's structured to the culture, like how the rules of that culture rule what is satire and what's not? Like, for example, if I took this work to, I don't know, South America, you know, and I tried to talk about it and then uh, explain how it's, like, maybe something... As soon as you have to explain it, it doesn't work anymore. Oh, okay. so I don't think you can explain it. I think it has to be understood what you're saying. You, you, it loses its bite and it loses its potency. And so here's the other aspect of the satire. It's not only that they have to share 
uh, a basic worldview, they have to recognize that they've departed from it and want to be restored to it. And this will be evident when I, we look at a modest proposal. Because the modest proposal, to give it all away, is that they eat babies to deal with the problem of the poor, to alleviate the problem of poverty, the, deal, the problem of malnutrition, the problem of stealing, the problem of too many Catholics, the problem of possible insurrection, all those sorts of, all those problems are solved by this modest proposal. But Swift, who's an Anglican clergyman, by the way, from Dublin, so he's not just anybody, he's, is uh, understood to be arguing the opposite of what he's proposing without, like everyone gets that. He says this, but he means that. Furthermore, what he's saying though by the modest proposal is he's satirizing a second group. It's, it's not just that we're not behaving like Christians in our current conduct. It's that um, I lost my train of thought. It's that we ought to be um, better than we are. It's not just that we ought to not be dehumanizing, because he's saying we're already doing this. We're effectively eating the poor. We're effectively treating the Roman Catholics as subhuman. We're effectively treating them as enemies, even though they're under the uh, rule of the United Kingdom. Effectively, that's already happening. There's more intended in a modest proposal than that, which is to attempt to try and make society better. And that's always the aim of satire. It's to poke fun harshly or subtly at vice and folly to get repentance and rehabilitation. That's the purpose of the satire. It's not to destroy. It's to call to repent and reform. So I think you can employ satire, you can use satire in stand-up comedy, and people do. People think it's funny. Humor is part of satire, like you have, it has to be funny. Uh, at least if it's gonna be the Ciceronian type or the Horatian type. If it's gonna be the <laughs> blasting people, that's actually quite funny as well, but it's not, humor that the object of the satire shares. They're not finding it very funny when they're called a brood of vipers or whitewashed sepulchers. There's no, like their teeth are gritting and they want to kill them. And I don't think that's what we do. We don't see that in stand-up comedy at all. That would be called hate speech. If you're calling for, if you're dehumanizing people with your, your speech in that way. Uh, so it would want to have that rehabilitating uh, motive there as well. But, this, but the intention then is, as I say, to improve and call people to repentance. So ultimately it does have that. And you'll see in the Old Testament when satire is employed, that is the aim, is to get people to call the people of God back to repentance and adherence to the covenant declared through Moses the prophetic witness, the prophets are often satirical. You, you cows of Bashan, he's talking about the women <laughs> in, in a, a little province in, in Egypt. You know, he's speaking of them of fat cows. They, they look after their, I mean, you can speak of women as fat cows now, but, but that's what, <laughs> but they've grown sleek. <laughs> yeah. They've gone sleek and they're really well fed and they're looking after themselves even while this is going on right under their noses and they don't, they don't attend to it. So you just call them, yeah, you're feeding, you're doing really well, you're, you're healthy, you're not getting sick, but look at this. Just the term cows of Bashan is satirical, comparing women to cows. Swift comes at it rather differently. Now, oh, different context, what's the context? This is the scientific era. So what else is he satirizing? In addition to satirizing the British and the nobility, because 
in, this, in the 18th century in Ireland, Ireland is under British rule and it has English aristocrats ruling over Irish peasants. After Oliver Cromwell, the end of Milton's, uh, the era that we talked about in Paradise Lost, under Cromwell's regime, Cromwell invades Ireland to put down a, a, a revolt, because there's a revolt going on in Ireland. And he goes up to Scotland and suppresses the revolt. He goes over to Ireland, suppresses that revolt, and he leaves English, English aristocrats there. And now we have five, 50 years later, what does this look like? And the, the reason the English aristocrats are there, one is because they're English, but two, because they're Protestants and they don't want Catholics, Papists, on their, on their flank, bringing about the return of the papacy in England. And this is particularly problematic because in Spain, there's a pretender to the throne, the British throne, that wants back in there. So there's a real live political threat rooted in religion. And the English aristocrats are there to prevent that to some degree. But how are they treating the Irish under their authority while this is happening? And Swift, who's an Anglican clergyman, is speaking to the, uh, to the English aristocracy in Ireland. That's the context, first context. Second piece of context, scientific age. He will appeal regularly to statistics, to science. Science says that. And if that doesn't sound familiar, I don't know where you've been for the last three years. The science says that. So an appeal to statistics, statistical modeling, statistical projection, as a way of argumentation. And what statistics does is it measures and quantifies everything, including things that before would have been considered to be qualitative, matters of value, but now it reduces them to facts. It reduces them, I say, it, and, and the reduction is a dehumanization. So everyone in the room here has the number one. Together we have the number, however many people are in the class. Is there a difference between individuals in the room? Well, not statistically, there isn't. You could say, well, there's a certain number of male or female. That, even that would be controversial in our day because somebody might self-identify as the other or whatever. Let's avoid all that topic. But you break things down into their lowest common denominator and the lowest common denominator, they have a number. So you accumulate them all together and then you have the hundreds and the thousands and the 10,000s, whatever, and you see them all as numbers, as statistics. And the sciences tend to do this. They reduce everything to number in order to make scientific calculations. And they regard that as the use of reason to do this this way. This will not be surprising because uh, since Swift's day, this is now intensified. That's how all governments work. They do statistical analysis. They do polls, that sort of things. They use numbers to guide policy. Numbers, they think, are the way to, for reasonable people to act in every situation. As I said, COVID was an illustration of the same. The numbers were used to drive policy or projections in that case, but never mind. Let, let's start at the beginning though. But, so that is important. He's going to appeal to science in order to critique science. So it's not just that he's critiquing the aristocrats, he's also critiquing a way of looking at people through the lens of number. You are not, you're a quantitative thing. If you kill a, a person, it's murder. If you kill a thousand or a hundred thousand, it's statistics. Because we have trouble reckoning with large scale killing. We, we can identify with a person dying. We have real great difficulty identifying with huge quantities of individuals dying. And so we reserve certain vocabulary like genocide for it, right? Which is very topical at the moment, as you can imagine. <laughs> right, and so once you get that sense, or oh, that word has that power, then everybody wants to claim everything's a genocide. 
even if it doesn't meet the description, and then people say, well, it's just semantics. I think, yeah. Anyway, let's start, let's look at this. Swift, it is a melancholy object to those who walk through this great town, Dublin, or travel in the country when they see the streets, the roads and cabin doors crowded with beggars of the female sex, followed by three, four, or six children, all in rags and importuning every passenger for an alms. These mothers, instead of being able to work for their honest livelihood, are forced to employ all their time in strolling to beg sustenance for their helpless infants, who, as they grow up, either turn thieves for want of work or leave their dear native country to fight for the pretender in Spain or sell themselves to the Barbados. So, three things. They're begging, they're fighting as an insurrection within Britain, or they're selling themselves into slavery. Sorry? Or they're stealing. Yeah, they're begging or stealing. They're acting as a, you know, they're signing up for the Spanish as, as willing fighters within Britain against the injustice being visited upon the Catholics, or because of their poverty, they're saying uh, their family selling them off as slaves. By the way, this is real. The Irish are selling themselves into slavery. You don't hear much about it, but it's, it's there. Um, in all three of these situations, anybody who's, who is reading this will recognize that none of these three outcomes are acceptable, none of the three. I think it is agreed by all parties that this prodigious number of children in the arms or on the backs or on the heels of their mothers and frequently of their fathers is in the present deplorable state of the kingdom a very great additional grievance. And therefore, whoever could find out a fair, cheap, and easy method of making these children sound useful members of the Commonwealth would deserve so well of the public as to have his statue set up for a preserver of the nation. You can imagine the political in Parliament in, in this time. They would speak of the Irish problem. This is a very big problem because the Irish are having a lot of babies, more babies than the Protestants are having. And so it's not just that there is a problem right now, the problem is growing over time and it needs to be addressed. So how do we solve the problem? I mean, how do you solve the problem? So it's a modest proposal. This would have been spoken of in London where Swift also frequented. By the way, he's a friend of Pope, as I said. It's often called the age of satire. But my intention is very far from being confined to provide only for the children of professed beggars. It is of a much greater extent and shall take in the whole number of infants at a certain age who are born of parents in effect as little able to support them as those who demand our charity in the streets. So he's not only gonna solve the problem for the kids, he's gonna solve it for everybody. Now I'm all listening. This is called, in marketing, this is the hook. He's got you, oh wow, I've identified a problem you recognize the problem. I'm going to give you a very cheap, easy, modest proposal to solve the problem. This is too good to be true, right? But it's, you're leaning in. I am, you have my attention. As to my own part, having turned my thoughts for many years upon this important subject and maturely weighed the several schemes of other projectors. By the way, everyone knows this, Jonathan, Jonathan Swift, the clergyman who's writing this. So it's a Christian. He's recognized as a Christian. They expect certain things from him. I have always found them grossly mistaken in their computation. This is the first note of, I think, humor, although it's subtle at this point. It's computation. And everybody's going to go, oh, he's a reasonable man. He's going to talk about numbers. Okay, it is true a child just dropped from its dam may be supported by her milk. Now the word dam, as it says here, is referred to, it's, it's in farm animals. It's the female is the dam. So he's already in the phrase referring to 
females, we, don't, we won't use this anymore. But in, in agriculture, they still will. They'll talk about its dam, at least in England. Maybe not in Canada, I don't know, but I don't think so. But you'll talk about female animals as the dam. And so by referring to female human beings as the dam, he's, he's comparing them to animals. Now, this is already dehumanizing, right? But he, he, why does he use the term? It's just subtle, and it's derogatory, and it's maybe acceptable. I don't even know what the parlance of the English aristocrats today, but maybe they're so contemptuous of the, these Irish who are papists, and they're begging, and they're stealing, and they're doing all the things he mentioned. Maybe he, they think them, they're like animals, these people. These people, yes. Considering his use of language, maybe it is his aim here to um, articulate what people are thinking. Yes, he's getting them alongside. First of all, he, like every the the, the 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 satire bites when you. I think I think it's powerful because there's a point at which you're totally with him. I think, and, and at, at at this point, I think everybody, he's addressed all the problems. He's proposing that there is a solution, it's simple and it's gonna solve, and you're like, okay. And then, and then there's a flip when it's like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, hold on a sec. But, and, and this is the first note of it, but it's on computation. They've, comp, they've calculated the numbers wrong. But the use of the word dam is also problematic. And it suggests that there's something not right about his moral antenna, the speaker. He's, all, he's calling women a term that would suggest that they're like farm animals. Well, not all women. Irish Catholic women. Those women. They're, they're the ones. Okay? So, it is true a child just dropped from its dam may be supported by her milk for a solar year with little other nourishment. At most, not above the value of two shillings. Now he's putting a price on the cost of nourishing the child, which the mother may certainly get, or the value in scraps, by her lawful occupation of begging. And it is exactly at one year old that I propose to provide for them, in such a manner as, instead of being a charge upon their parents, or their parish, or wanting food, and raiment for the rest of their lives, raiment is clothing, they shall, on the contrary, contribute to the feeding and partly to the clothing of many thousands. Now, this just sounds too good to be true. And there is likewise another great advantage in my scheme, that it will prevent those voluntary abortions. Oh, that's very Christian as well. It'll prevent voluntary abortions and that horrid practice of women murdering their bastard children. Alas, too frequent among us sacrificing the poor innocent babes. I doubt no, more to avoid the expense than the shame, which would move tears and pity in the most savage and inhuman breast. Now, what's he, what is intended by that phrase? Why do they have abortions? Why do they murder their newborn children? Too expensive. Who on earth? What sort of disgusting person would kill a human being because of the cost? Irish filth. <laughs> right? The, they're, do, they're doing it because of this. They're seeing this in monetary terms. Disgusting. What sort of people are these? Like, that's there in this. Now, it, it's, it's, though, that's how they think. Note there's a strong them and us thing. Now, that flips when the them becomes us, and that's what's coming. But at this point, he is saying that they're like that, and everybody's, yes, they are. Oh, who could, who could abort a child? What a horrid thing. Who would kill their own child? And do it just for the money? Awful. Horrible. This is why we hate papists. Good Protestants would never do something like this. Right? Okay. And it would move to... Tears and pity the most savage and inhuman breast. Okay. And he just leaves that and then he moves on in computational language. But now we're totally on his side. This man's moral compass is totally intact. It's solid. He's recognized all the evils that the, those Catholic Irish are doing 
and, and we are with him. Okay, so now he's building up his credibility. Uh, the number of souls in this kingdom being usually reckoned one million and a half. Of these, I calculate there may be 200,000 couple whose wives are breeders. Hmm. Breeders. From which number, I'll just pass over that. The, 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 from whose number I subtract, again, you'll speak of livestock and breeders. Uh, from which number I subtract 30,000 couples who are able to maintain their own children. Although I apprehend there cannot be so many under the present distresses of the kingdom. That's a little humor. That's how bad things are. But this being granted, there will remain 170,000 breeders. I again subtract 50,000 for those women who miscarry or whose children die by accident or disease within the year. There only remain 120,000 children of poor parents annually born. The question, therefore, is how this number shall be reared and provided for, which, as I've already said, under the present situation of affairs is utterly impossible by all the methods hitherto proposed. For we can neither employ them in handicraft or agriculture. We neither build houses. I mean in the country. They're building in the cities, but they're not building where they actually are. We, we can't do it. We can't build them in the green belts. Can't build houses there. Nor cultivate land. We couldn't use the land that's there. We want to keep the land uncultivated under the rule of the their lordships. They can be very seldom, they can very seldom pick up a livelihood by stealing until they arrive at six years old, except where they are of towardly parts. So most kids can't steal in, until they're six, although there are some who are really good at stealing even before that. If they're really capable, you can steal even before you're six. Wow. Though I confess they learn the rudiments much earlier, during which time they can, however, be looked upon as probationers only. As I've been informed by a principal gentleman in the country of Cavan, who protested to me that he never knew above one or two instances under the age of six, even in the part of the kingdom so renowned for the quickest proficiency in that art. So I guess the people in the, the county of Cavan are notorious thieves. A little, I guess, an Irish inside joke. Of all the thieves in Ireland, they're the most uh, proficient in theft are from that county. Okay, so all of this is laid out there, and now comes the proposal. Yes, before I do that. The name of the person who wrote this? Sorry? Oh, it's Swift himself. Jonathan Swift is making the proposal. Well, so this is the thing. He is Irish himself, but he's an Anglican, so he represents the Church of England in Ireland. And so he's on both sides. He, he, he's in Ireland. He is a clergyman in Dublin. He represents the English, and he's writing to the English about the Irish problem, the Irish Catholic problem. But they're not the people in his parish. The people in the Anglican Church are Protestants who adhere to England, so they're patriots. They're the, they're the group that he is seeing as on his side, and the, uh, those on the other side, though, well, those are the Irish Catholics, and they're the problem. Yeah. But he's identifying, he, the, he is the Anglican uh, defending England and Protestantism, etc. And that's part of the potency of his proposal here is that you have certain expectations from him. Surely he's gonna defend all of the things. And up to this point, he has. He, he's a moral man. You expect this from a clergyman, especially an Anglican one. But he says, I am assured by our merchants that a boy or 12 or a girl before 12 years old is no saleable commodity. You can't sell children under 12. And even when they come to this age, they will not yield above three pounds or three pounds and a half a crown at most on the exchanges. What are the exchanges? What's he talking about? You can sell a 12-year-old. Where can you sell a 12-year-old? 
slavery. You don't want a child as a slave. They're not, they're not strong enough. They're not capable enough. So you you got to look after them. They're not really providing their worth. But once they get to adulthood, they've hit that age, then they're, they become saleable. But you got to raise them to that point. It's like you can get a, a, a cat or a dog. You can get the, 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 the pup or the kitty, kitty but then you give them the shots and you got to give them the food and all that. So uh, like it costs a lot more to bring a cat or a dog up and, until, and once they've got the shots, well then you got to pay more for them or you can get them less and then you got to give them all the shots, whatever. So they're worth at most three or three and a half, uh, three pounds and a half a crown, which cannot turn to account either to their parents or to the kingdom. The charge of nutriment and rags having been at least four times that value. So there, there's no business proposition in that. If it costs four times as much to raise them to the age of 12 as it does to sell them at the age of 12, there's no profit there. On the contrary, you're losing money. I shall now therefore humbly propose my own thoughts, which I hope will not be liable to the least objection. Not the least. Who could possibly? I've been assured, and this is sort of funny, by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London. You know, he's going to blame the French and the Americans. The Americans are, you know what the Americans like? God. Colonialists, they don't, they're not very civilized. That a young, healthy child well-nursed is at a year old a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food, whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled. And I make no doubt that it will equally serve in a fricassee or a ragu, a meat stew. I do therefore humbly offer it. Now he just moves on very quickly with that. And that huh? What did he just say? And I do therefore humbly offer to public consideration that of the 120,000 children already computed, 20,000 may be reserved for breed. So we're not going to eat them all because we want to replicate the stock and you know, we don't want to just make a one-off monetary um, advance here, solve the problem. We can keep making money off this. 20,000 may be reserved for breed, whereof only one fourth part to be males which is more than we allow to sheep, black cattle, or swine, in case you're worrying about the numbers here. Like, we're not dehumanizing. We, there's more than we allow there. And my reason is that these children are seldom the fruits of marriage, a circumstance not much regarded by our savages, those Irish. They are children outside of marriage. Uh, a circum uh, there, therefore, one male will be sufficient to serve for females. Again, this is agricultural talk, service means to impregnate. You've got the, the bull male, whatever, and he will, you put him to stud, right? That's all breeding of this sort. That the remaining 100,000 may at, one, at a year old be offered in sale to the persons of quality and fortune throughout this kingdom, always advising the mother to let them suck plentifully in the last month so as to render them plump and fat for a good table. A child will make two dishes at entertainment for friends, and when the family dines alone, the fore or hind quarter will make a reasonable dish and seasoned with a little pepper or salt will be very good boiled on the fourth day, especially in winter. I have reckoned upon a medium that a child just born will weigh 12 pounds. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> that's those big babies. Okay. And in a solar year, if tolerably nursed, increases, increases to 28 pounds. Those are huge babies. <laughs> and one year, that's a big, fat one-year-old. I grant this food will be somewhat dear and therefore very proper for landlords, who, as they have already devoured most of the parents, seem to have their best title to the children. Now here's the satire. You stick the knife in. You're already eating the parents. Effectively, you're consuming them. Now we're literally going to consume them. Infants' flesh will be in season throughout the year, but more plentiful in March and a little before and after. How come in March? Season of Lent is over, and, uh, and it 
breeding season, I guess. We're into the spring and <laughs> a little before and after. For we are told by a grave author, an eminent French physician, that fish being a prolific diet, there are more children born in Roman Catholic countries about nine months after Lent than at any other season because they're abstaining from sexual relations. But once Lent's over, back at it. And so babies come and they come in March. Once the, 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 right? So there we go. Therefore, reckoning a year after Lent, the markets will be more glutted than usual because the number of popish infants is at least three to one in this kingdom. And therefore it will have one other collateral advantage by lessening the number of papists among us. Who's not to like this proposal? It solves the political problem, solves the religious problem, solves the financial problem, solves the thieving problem, solves the, solves pretty much every problem. And the money goes to the parents. They benefit from it. Rather than being burdened by the children, they benefit from it. The landlords benefit from it because they get to eat the babies. And the babies are really tasty, apparently. And you can even make gloves out of them, the skin. It's coming to that. You can do all sorts of things. Let, let, let's not waste anything. You can boil down afterwards. You can use the, the skin for gloves. I've already computed the charge of nursing a beggar's child, in which list I reckon all cottagers, laborers, and four-fifths of the farmers to be about two shillings per annum, rags included, and I believe no gentleman would, re would repine to give ten shillings for the carcass of a good fat child, which, as I have said, will make four dishes of excellent nutritive meat when he hath only some particular friend or his own family to dine with him. Thus the squire will learn to be a good landlord. Ah, it will make the landlords more kindly towards their tenants because after all, they're going to benefit from the children getting fat and treat them better. It will be in their self-interest. Basically, everybody's self-interests are met here. If only Mr. Swift were around the time of Egypt, he could have proposed this to the Egyptians. <laughs> you don't have to make bricks without straw, just, just eat them and give them a profit incentive and they'll eat their own babies. We'll eat their babies and we'll give them money for it. Those who are more thrifty, as I must confess the times require, may flay the carcass, the skin of which artificially dressed will make admirable gloves for ladies and summer boots for fine gentlemen. Okay, so you get this. Now, it's clear at this point that the horror of his initial proposal has an object which is totally unacceptable. But he's not even admitted this. And why has he not admitted that this is an appalling proposal? Why has he not even admitted it? What's the effect of this? I mean, it's obvious, but how come he hasn't admitted the obvious or doesn't see it? How come? Well, it's part of the satire to continue the joke. Yes. They turn on him as well. They're saying, this is wrong. This is wrong. Like at first, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, proposal, and now they're saying, no, this is appalling. This is abhorrent. We can't eat babies. We can't materially, financially benefit from killing and eating babies. Like, what are you thinking? So it's pushing them against him. He's making the proposal, but he knows that there ought to, at this point to be a moral opposition to everything he's just proposed. So that's part two. Part one's getting them all inside. Part two is getting them all against it. And then part three is to say, okay, well then what do we do with this? Because that's what we're already doing. Right? So you have to get, so the, back to the satire in the nightclub, that's just going after a group and having fun making mockery and so forth. But that's not really satire. Satire is bringing people back to a moral awareness of the common humanity of the other people that they're dehumanizing. I don't see that. The Andrew Tates or whatever, you go after a group hard and whatever, that's not satire. That's just, that's sort of abusive language. It's not recognizing the common humanity, which is in, in, in essential to satire in the Old Testament as well. So he, he satirizes the Jewish people for acting just like the pagans. 
and the pagan nations, and they're not recognizing that they all bear the image of God and that they all are under God's law, etc., etc. That's why the satire works, because there, a we're all in this group together. And the, it began with, there's the Catholics, here are the Protestants, there are the Irish, here are the English. But the, the way it pulls together is when you see it together. I don't see that appeal to a common humanity in the satire today. I just don't see it. Yes? Uh, would it be just, uh, even the people, like, immorally based who show the reality that they're living in, like, for example, if we're, like, one in the extreme extremes, right, then the people don't understand the extreme that they're living in, right? So if you try to do the satire to give them the whole other stream that will change the way of their living, like, it will give a solution, but everybody, everybody agrees that it's morally wrong. Therefore, they have to... They're, mo they're motivated to solve the problem then. Yeah, but now they're forced to even, I would argue, to realize their own extreme reality. Yes. They want to they wanna go against the other ones so bad because they, they realize now that it's so wrong, but it, it could be a solution that now they're forced to look at their own reality and reflect on it. Yes, and having seen, so what he's forcing them to do is see something that they've been, I'm not looking at that. I don't want to look at that. And I'm gonna do, I'm gonna ignore it. I'm gonna to stick to my group. I'm gonna ignore what's going on there. I'm going to speak slightingly of that group and I'll pretend not to see it. He has forced them to see it by tricking them. He's tricked them into seeing something that they didn't wanna look at. Now that they've seen it, they can't look away from it. So now what are they gonna do? The ball's in their court. That's, that's what the satire does. It's meant to bring people to moral conduct. It's satire is always employed in the context of societies that are going, uh, conducting immoral activities. This is the age of slavery in Ireland, but also the transatlantic slave trade, right? Uh, this is not related to that or not about that, but that's going on in the same period. And again, it's happening. People know that it's wrong but they see, well, but how do we solve this problem? There's no practical way, practical way of solving the problem. What do they mean by practical? It's gonna cost a lot of money to solve this problem. It's gonna cost somebody a lot to stop this. There's gonna be a cost. And uh, he even appealed to that right at the beginning. It's gonna be cheap and it's gonna be easy. And they like that, cheap and easy. I like that solution. So again, it's gonna get them to reassess the statistics are predicated on a certain view that is dehumanizing from the, begin with, from the beginning. Now apparently he's, he's just gonna carry on with this. He's proposed this to a, a gentleman he uh, was, addressing before and has given this proposal and now there's a refinement on the proposal. A very worthy person, now at this stage, when he says that the person's very worthy, you suspect that it's probably the opposite that is meant. A very worthy person, a true lover of his country and whose virtues I highly esteem was lately pleased in discoursing on this matter to offer a refinement upon my scheme. He said that many gentlemen of this kingdom having of late destroyed their dear he conceived that the want of venison might be well supplied by the bodies of young lads and maidens, not exceeding 14 years of age, nor under 12. So great a number of both sexes in every country being now ready to starve for want of work and service, and these to be disposed of by their parents, if alive or otherwise by their dearest relation. So not cut off at 12, we'll add 13, 14 year olds into the scheme because there's not enough venison. We've hunted off all the deer. Okay. But with due deference to so excellent a friend and so deserving a patriot, I cannot be altogether in his sentiments. For as to the males, my American acquaintance assured me from frequent experience that their flesh was generally tough and lean like that of our schoolboys by continual exercise. So you got to get them before they're too strong. And then the, the meat isn't as tender. I mean, I guess you could take a hammer and tenderize the meat by pounding it, I guess. But I mean, he didn't think about that. If Swift had been a little bit more aware of cooking, then maybe he would have thought as I and entertained this. But 
and their tastes disagreeable, and to fatten them would not answer the charge. Then as to the females, it would, I think, with humble submission, be a loss to the public because they soon would become breeders themselves. And that's a waste because you, you can multiply the benefits of women at that point. Before they reach the age of breeding, there's no loss. But as soon as they reach the age of breeding, then you can have multiple persons. So it's just, a, and, and that's the moral response to the humble submission. It's again, financial. So what's he suggesting here? Everything is about money. And he calls that the moral consideration, which shows that he is either lost his compass entirely and is a madman, or he is satirizing his audience for doing exactly this at all times. Yes? Actually, I comment on that. It's just, I, I want to say how I like the law, how he says every time he's bringing a new idea or like just following his ideas with humble submission. You know, it's just like, it don't take me too seriously. You know, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, because uh, even from the, from the beginning of the topic, it's like, you know, a humble uh, suggestion. So what, what else is he doing then? He's satirizing the appearance of civility, which is masking barbarism. You can wear, you can be like the rape, rape of the lock, you can get up at 12 noon, you can put on all the petticoats, you can meet in civil society, you can have the manners, you can drink your tea, you can play cards all day. Um, but are you a better human being? Well, this is the age of reason, it's the age of enlightenment, it's the age of progress, etc. Is the age of progress actually that progressive or is it masking a darkness beneath it? And that's obviously what he's suggesting. It works better because everyone claims to be civilized. After all, we're not like in the dark ages. We're in the enlightenment. In the dark ages, they did such horrible things to people, but we are far superior. After all, we have science on our side. Anyway, but um, be a loss of pipe because they soon would become breeders. And besides, it is not improbable that some scrupulous people might be apt to censure such a practice, although indeed very unjustly, as a little bordering upon cruelty, which I confess hath always been with me the strongest objection against any project how well soever intended. A little bordering on cruelty, just a little. But in order to satisfy my friend, he confessed that this expedient was put into his head by the famous Salmanazar, a native of the island Formosa, who came from thence to London about 20 years ago and in conversation told my friend that in his country, when any young person happened to be put to death, the Executioner sold the carcass to persons of quality as a prime dainty. Now, who are these people? Formosa, this is in the Philippines. And that in his time, the body of a plump girl of 15 who was crucified for an attempt to poison the emperor was sold to his imperial majesty's prime minister of state and other great mandarins of the court in joints from the gibbet at 400 crowns. In other words, uh, Formosa's Taiwan, sorry, where cannibalism was practiced. These are the savages, and this is the proposal. Okay, so I think you get the general just here. Uh, but then at the end, he starts to list the advantages here, and he will enumerate them. Now, you will have noticed that in essays that you've written yourselves and have read, that is a common practice to number your points. Again, it's paying lip service or actually intellectual nodding towards number as a way of calculating the worth of points. You're, you're numbering them. There's so many advantages, firstly, secondly, thirdly. But you're just, there's no sense of hierarchy of value in this. It's just numbers. But you're throwing numbers at things. And again, he's attacking the, <coughs> the, the social sciences uh, tendency to reduce everything to numbers. All arguments come down to numbers. What are the advantages though? Greatly lessen the number of papists. That's good. With whom we are yearly overrun, being the principal breeders of the nation as well as our most dangerous enemies, who stay at home on purpose to deliver the kingdom to the pretender. Secondly, they'll have something valuable of their own. Thirdly, 
Whereas the maintenance of 100,000 children from two years old and upwards cannot be computed at less than 10 shillings a piece per annum, the nation's stock will be thereby increased 50,000 pounds per annum. A lot of money. Rather than losing money, we're going to make money. Fourthly, constant breeders will be rid of the charge of maintaining them after the first year. And fifthly, it will do the taverns really good business. Our, our cuisine will be the envy of the whole world. Nobody will have food quite like we do. And we'll come up with inventive, fantastic ways of presenting the babies. Who else eats babies like this? Nobody but the English. Sixthly, this would be a great inducement to marriage. Aha! Well, who wouldn't want a inducement to marriage, which all wise nations have either encouraged by rewards or enforced by laws and penalties. It would increase the care and tenderness of mothers toward their children when they are sure of a settlement for life to the poor babes provided in some sort by the public. Yes. Don't you think the government should get behind this? Sure. Yes. I actually just plucked this off the internet and I had no intention. I'm not even, I haven't even looked at them. But they are rather odd, aren't they? Now that I see this and I don't even know, what, know what's going on here. Yeah, they're rather macabre. So apologies for that. Or maybe not. Maybe it's an interesting, uh, this is obviously not Swift's edition. It's a later publication of it. But we should see an honest emulation among the married women. Which of them could bring the fattest child to the market? Like your, the pet pig, you know, that wins the country prize. My baby's the fattest. Hey, give the prize out. So suck, 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 babe. Got the biggest babe and I made the most money. Men would become as fond of their wives during the time of their pregnancy as they are now of their mares and foal, their cows and calf, or sows when they are ready to farrow, nor offer to beat or kick them as is too frequent a practice for fear of miscarriage. It will make men treat their wives better. I mean, the, what, this solves so many problems. Abuse of spouses solved. Many other advantages might be enumerated. For instance, the addition of some thousand carcasses in our exportation of barreled beef, the propagation of swine's flesh, and improvement in the art of making good bacon, so much wanted among us by the great destruction of pigs too frequent at our tables, which are in no way comparable in taste or magnificence to a well-grown, fat, yearling child, which roasted whole will make a considerable figure at a Lord Mayor's feast or any other public entertainment. But this and many others, I admit, being studious of brevity. So anyway, it just piled. And he cannot think of a, of a response, an objection to this. Can't think of one. No one that will possibly be raised against this proposal, unless it should be urged that the number of people will be thereby lessened much in the kingdom. And this I freely own. And that was one of the aims. Get rid of the numbers. I desire the reader will observe that I calculate my remedy for this one individual kingdom of Ireland and for no other than ever was, is, or I think ever can be upon earth. Therefore, let no man talk to me of other expedients. And don't talk about these things. Here's what Swift actually wants. I don't even want to hear about the other proposals. Taxing our absentees at five shillings a pound. So the people who uh, are Irish citizens but are absent and they're not currently getting taxed as a way of bringing wealth, like they're, uh, they're overseas evading taxes. Let's not do that. Of using neither clothes nor household furniture except what is of our own growth and manufacture. So producing things at home, not importing them cheaply from overseas. Let's not talk about uh, utterly rejecting the materials and instruments to pr promote foreign luxury, of curing the expensiveness of pride, vanity, idleness, and gaming in our women. Let's not do that. No moral improvement. Um, of introducing a vein of parsimony, prudence, and temperance, of learning to love our country, in the want of which we differ even from the Laplanders and the inhabitants of Topinambu. Topinambu. 
I've never heard of that. An area in Brazil, there you go. Of quitting our animosities and factions, nor acting any longer like the Jews who were murdering each other at the very moment the city was taken in uh, uh, 70 AD. Of being a little cautious not to sell our country in conscience for nothing, of teaching landlords to have at least one degree of mercy towards their tenant, lastly, of putting a spirit of generosity, industry, and skill into our shopkeepers. None of that, I don't want to hear about any of that. That's what he would propose, of course. But if he started with that, everyone's going to say, Pah. But if the tendency of their practices and their, the inclinations of their thoughts is towards eating the Irish alive, more or less. And he's now demonstrated the outcome of a certain, ideas have consequences. If this is the consequence of a certain way of dehumanizing thinking towards other people, then maybe you want to consider what I would have presented at the outset and you would have, out, you would have dismissed it out of hand. You would have said he's just a moralizing stupid clergyman. This is ridiculous. Therefore, I repeat, let no man talk to me of these and like expedients till he hath at least some glimpse of hope that there will ever be some hearty and sincere attempt to put them in practice. Thoughts on Mr. Swift's modest proposal? It's not modest. It's a scandalous proposal. The irony is obvious. The satire, the object of the satire is the English aristocrats. Um, the British public, the scientific establishment, uh, but above all, it's, a it's aimed at vice and folly in his day, and he wants vice and folly to be addressed, and it can only be addressed by people who have been sufficiently piqued uh, by his argument to want to change their ways, but they have to have been forcibly, personally addressed by the proposal and then had it flip on them. And I cannot think of how satire can be used in this day because for, for the last, I don't know how many decades, the uh, universities have divided people into identity groups and doesn't see a common human nature. They don't promote a common humanity. And so a satire doesn't really work. You have to appeal to the all of us, even, even if you're addressing an individual group. You have to be able to do that to get that group to flip on itself. Um, so I don't, I don't agree that satire is even used in our day. It, there's something like satire, it's, it's poking at them, but the aim is not to get them to recognize a common humanity and treat them as such. Any comments or questions on that? Just thoughts. I'm done with this at this point. Yes, sir. Did this essay bring about any noticeable impact or change, or was it just... Nope. It's a famous essay. Pope is, uh, and Swift are famous satirists. Uh, he's also the author of Gulliver's Travels and so forth. Um, Tale of the Tub, The Battle of the Books. Swift is a terrific satirist. It's the age of satire. I think it has some effect, but it, it, it almost brings about an awareness that a movement of God is necessary for a country to change. People, even when faced with their own sin, as he's doing here, are not willing to do it because it's not in their self-interest. It's in the interest of others, but they don't care. They just don't care. Um, so things get worse as a result. Anyway. Uh, but that's not the aim of the satirist. The satirist is to hold a glass up to humanity, to let humanity see itself the way it really is. And that's no uh, mean uh, aim to do that. Show people the way they really are. And it's not, you don't want to see it. And that, again, satirists get attacked by their own, like who, who's going to be angry at Swift? His own people. Just like the prophets. That's why the prophets always use satire. 
and are, are, are attacked. Nobody wants to be a prophet. Your own side turns on you. Yes? No, I don't think so. He's too popular. He's too witty. And uh, his popularity is a bit of a shield, but you can be sure his life would be made difficult as well, and he would not be uh, welcomed in certain societies. But there's a sufficient, um, and, and this is true of scripture in general, there is sufficient warrant within the biblical tradition for a prophetic strand to attack those in-house. It's there from the beginning. And Jesus, as I say, is one and the chief exemplar of this, the chief satirist and the most savage of them all. So there is warrant for people within the church to attack the abusers within the church, not just those outside of it. Those outside of it, in fact, don't get that form of satire. They get a different treatment because they don't know any better. But these are the people who claim to be something other than what they're actually their actions are suggesting. So, yeah. I think it's still a wonderful example and something to think about. Um, and it's something very, very different than we've presented on the course thus far. And I didn't want to uh, keep you from it. I think it's great. It's not very modest either. This is in interesting. I don't even know what this is. But I'm done for today. Uh, what are we doing?